and welcome. It's another Confessions podcast. Thanks very much for downloading the latest collection of terrible tales from the very sinful Radio 2 listener. This week we bring for you a bogus Beatles briefing, a Glasto Goos gaff, a hypothetical haunting hellion, I know, and a folk festival for... Here we go with another drive time confession. This is from Penny Lane. For reasons that will become obvious, Father Simon and the Collective, having listened to your comments last week about showing off your natural flair for foreign accents, I thought I'd give you the chance to use a German accent by reading out my confession. Let's add that to the uh, quiver. Well, you know it's going to be... You know exactly what it's going to be. To set the scene... It's 1987 and I was 22. I had taken the day off work and planned a trip to London to meet up with two friends. We got up bright and early and caught the coach from Northampton to London, Victoria. Now, me and my friends were huge Beatles fans and we had decided that we would make a pilgrimage to Abbey Road Studios, an absolute must-see for any self-respecting Beatles fan. The thing is, none of us was that familiar with London and we didn't really know where Abbey Road was. Clearly, they didn't think of buying a map. We consulted some. Oh, there we go. We consulted some maps in Victoria Coach Station, and though and though we had a rough idea where we were going, we set off. Well, we walked for miles, and we got completely lost on the unfamiliar underground. But eventually, we stumbled upon the corner of Abbey Road. We were ecstatic with joy, jumping up and down, hugging the sign. There it was, just like the picture on the back of the album: Abbey Road, NW8. It was real, and we had found it. So we then started looking around for the famous studios. We knew that they what they looked like because we'd seen pictures in Beatles books, but none of the buildings looked remotely like what we were looking for. Eventually we spotted a postman. He'd know where it was. And this is where we found out that Abbey Road is in fact a very long road and that we were at completely the wrong end. We were hot and tired and we couldn't come this far and give up, so we set off for the long walk to the other end of Abbey Road, singing, of course, the long and winding road as we went. Now, of course, Abbey Road is not only famous for the studios, but for the Zebra Crossing featured on the front cover of the album. But what a lot of people probably don't know is that there is more than one Zebra Crossing on Abbey Road. In fact, there are many. This is important. We finally reached our destination, and there it was in all its famous glory, Abbey Road Studios. Directly in front of it was the famous Zebra Crossing, and on this crossing, a gang of lads. Four of them in total, all clambering over the sacred ground that is the famous Abbey Road Zebra Crossing. We were standing a couple of hundred yards from them, but could hear that they were foreign, and we could work out that they were German students. These lads were having a fine old time. One of them had a camera and was taking pictures of them all in silly poses. At one point, one of them lay on the Zebra Crossing, while the other one shimmied up the Belisha Beacon to get a better shot. This is bad behaviour. It was at this point, Father Simon, I saw red. I had tramped through the hot, dusty streets of London and had finally made it to a place I'd only ever dreamt about visiting, only to find it being desecrated by a group of unworthy tourists who appeared to have no regard for one of our most iconic landmarks. I ran towards them, waving my arms and shouting, No! It's the wrong one! This is the wrong crossing! (laughs) They all stopped in their tracks and stared at me. I don't know how much English they understood, but they got the gist of what I was saying. One of them came towards me saying, and here's your chance, Father Simon, to use your German accent, Was ist das? <laughs> no, no Beatles here, you say? <laughs> <laughs> no Beatles here? Oh, no. excellent. No, I said, no Beatles here. Kein Paul, George, Wrinkle, Kein John. No, none of them. I know who the Beatles are and none of them. The, and it's the wrong zebra... Wrong crossing! I spoke very slowly in words of one syllable, as you're supposed to do when speaking yeah. to foreigners. I turned and pointed down the street, away from the studios, to the next crossing down, and said, That one! That's the one that's on the cover! That's the one that the Beatles used! All of them stood there, taking in every word I was saying, and more importantly, they believed me. They all stood there repeating, No Beatles here! <laughs> no! No Beatles here! No Beatles here! Yeah, no, and I nodded. Better. Yeah. emphatically. I gave a sympathetic shrug of my shoulders. I just continued to put... Over there! <laughs> anyway, they traipsed off to the next crossing along where they took scores of photos of the wrong crossing, although they thought it was the right crossing. Once they were gone, me and my friends were free to worship at the shrine of all things Beetle. We peered through the railings at the mighty Abbey Road studios, wrote messages of peace and love all over the white wall in permanent black marker. 
as is the right of every Beatles fan, and took photographs of each other on the revered zebra crossing, believing ourselves to be walking in the footsteps of the Beatles, even though the council had probably repainted it several times since 1969. Anyway, by the time we walked back down Abbey Road, there was no sign of the Germans. Not that we were going to apologise anyway. But I seek forgiveness from that particular group of German students who to this day believe, must believe, that they have a load of photos of the right zebra crossing, which is actually the wrong zebra crossing. Now... At the time, I felt no remorse, but 28 years down the line, I am older and wiser and can now concede that it was a bit mean to mislead four fellow Beatles fans who had as much right as I had to pay homage to their heroes. Lots of love, Penny Lane. Anyway, so interesting. I'm not quite sure why Penny behaved the way she did, really. All they had to do was just wait for the Germans to finish their photo session and then they could take them up. Anyway, Sister Pauline, what do you what do you make of uh, Penny Lane's treatment there of our it's German a bit, friends? It's a bit petty, was it? A little bit petty. And if, frankly, you've come from North Ham- Northampton to London, then you too are a tourist, just as much as someone who's come from Germany. Frankly, no superiority there. Yeah, I think that's a bit mean. I think that, yeah, she might have been hot and bothered, but oh, I think that's a bit mean. I like the way she, she's, oh, as though Northampton is like thousands of miles away. <laughs> it's although she visited a different country by coming to London, London on the coach. Sister Bobby from the Priory. What I, you I thought there would be a kind of kinship amongst fans, you know, a kind of, to meet your kind, the this kind of monument of this great band. She could have friend of them. You, 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 you them. missed an opportunity. In your meanness, you missed an opportunity for yourself to get a photo of you and your friend that they could have taken for you. Mm. So, you know... Everyone lost, and I thought it was a really mean, 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 mean thing to do. Ich bin ein Abbey Roder. Not forgiven. <laughs> okay. It's a mean thing. What do you think, Matthew? Um, well, they got the photos anyway. I mean, they, they resorted to lying on the on the zebra crossing, haven't they? So they obviously already got the photos. They all look the same yeah, zebra yeah, crossings. Yeah, they're zebra crossings. And apparently, that, well, I do. Know, there is a there is a great um, Twitter feed of people complaining about the zebra crossing at Abbey Road, saying it's just a zebra crossing. There's nothing. It's all it is. is a, well, of course, that's the point. It's a zebra. Crossing. It happens to be a very famous zebra crossing, but it is just a way of getting from one part, one pavement to the other pavement. Um, so, uh, for that reason, I am going to forgive. <laughs> Yes, because because of them all. Get, they all got all their photos anyway, didn't they? All right, fair enough. Yeah. It's another drive time confession, and it's Christina's confession. <clears throat> Father Simon, forgive me, collected. Whilst watching the coverage of Glastonbury recently, I was reminded of my one foray into deepest Somerset to the famous festival. This is a Glastonbury confession, as you might have realised. It was 21 years ago, and I am admitting to that only because I'm changing the names in order to protect the innocent. Please do not use my name, as it could ruin a promising career. So I'm assuming that Christina's down here, we changed it. We? We didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's a hot summer. I was 19 years old and enjoying the freedom that attending a university in a town far away from my parents gives. This time, I was a little short of funds and I had my exams and I told my mum I was revising madly for them. In fact, I told him, I told my mum I'd been working so hard that I hadn't been able to cover my shifts at the local student bar, so I was a little skint. Very kindly, she sent me £100 which I thought I could put to good use at the amazing Glastonbury Festival, rather than wasting it on food and other things like that and books and stuff. So me and my friend, we're going to call her Martha, packed our sleeping bags and tent, set off to the motorway where we proceeded to hitch a lift. Different times, Matt, different times. Different times. times. Luckily, being girls, I think, sorry, but it must have helped, says Christina, we got a lift almost immediately. We had to change drivers at uh, motorway services, but we got another lift straight away, right to the gates, as the gentleman driver happened to be going that way. What a stroke of luck. Started going wrong when we arrived uh, and waved off the nice driver. As his car drove away, Martha says, Where are the tent poles? I looked down at my inadequately sized bag in my hand, which I'd uh, I'd fitted in my sleeping bag and hot pants, but not the tent poles, because I'd carried them separately, except that I'd actually left them in the car boot. Anyway, being the philosophical types, we shrugged and concentrated on the usual stuff that 19-year-old students do at Glastonbury. Yeah. Sorry, the next bit's gone. <laughs> but without a tent to get the small amount of sleep, uh, it, we fell asleep in the scorching sun on day two, and we both woke up with the worst sunburnt faces, but only on one side, <laughs> which made us look slightly bizarre and unhinged. So we fitted in with Glastonbury quite nicely. One half bright red, the other half mildewy cream. A very nice look, yeah. which you should cultivate. 
Although don't get burnt, that's a very good thing. When it was time to leave, we hitched our way home and congratulated each other on doing Glastonbury proud. In fact, my trouble was just beginning. So here we go. Father Simon. I don't want forgiveness from Martha for forgetting the tent poles and being the cause of the sunburnt skin on our faces to crack like a dried up riverbed. I don't even ask for forgiveness for failing to attend my law exam on the Monday as my face was literally falling off. It's probably exaggerating a little. However, I do ask for forgiveness for lying repeatedly to my long suffering mother, the one who'd given me a hundred pounds to spend on food, which I spent at Glastonbury, and who I lied to and constantly denied it. Because she said this. Have you been to Glastonbury? <laughs> no. <laughs> Have you been smoking? Oh, no. I said no. Did you spend some of the money I sent you on drink? <laughs> no. I denied everything. No, no and no. She then showed me her copy of the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> Oh, excellent. Which featured a large photograph of me, half burnt, half not burnt, with a fag in my mouth, lo looking a little worse for wear. What a lovely picture you paint, Christy. Even though it was clearly me, I said it wasn't. I know it's amazingly like me, but actually it's not. But that's your Spin Doctors T-shirt, isn't it? It's, it's like it, but it actually isn't. OK, dear. Christina concludes... I've been feeling guilty about this for years. Can I be forgiven? Sorry, Mum, it was me after all, despite my constant denials, to, uh, and I've stuck to that to this very day. Wow. So, since 1994, <laughs> Christina said, yeah, I'm, it was clearly her it, <laughs> at Glastonbury, but she's denied it to her mum because she basically wasted the £100 uh, instead of spending it on food uh, on going to Glastonbury. There you go, and then the Daily Telegraph has the photograph. What do you think of that? Sister Pauline. Well, <clears throat> after a lifetime of experience of both being the lying to one's parents and being lied to by my offspring, your mother didn't believe you. You were torturing yourself unnecessarily. So I she don't knew. Think. She knew all along. She just chose not to confront you. But she never trusted you again, Christina. So just console yourself with that. So I forgive you because your mum never, ever fell for it. Yeah, you are going to spot your own kid <laughs> with a fag in their mouth at a festival, aren't you? You're really? bound to believe I them when they so. say it's not me, just someone who looks exactly like Sister me. Bobby from the Priory. Uh, what I'm hoping is, given the passing of time, that Christina was now a music lawyer, a very successful one. <laughs> And that what she should do is a she liar should, or a lawyer? No, lawyer. <laughs> I mean, a music lawyer. Same thing. Oh, um, so what, and now what she'll do is she'll get a hundred pounds together and she'll go to her mum and go, Mum, you know that picture, and you know that hundred pounds that you gave me, and you, I don't know what you went without to give me that hundred pounds. Here's the hundred pounds back, and I'm really sorry. And you hope her mum that gives her a look and says, actually, secretly, I was really pr proud that you did that yeah. because you did, Glastonbury, in hot pants with no tent. Have a blamange. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been there. Okay, so well. I think as generally I forgive you as long as you give her £100 back right. and stop her feeling like a crazy person and Brother, say it was me. Brother Matthew. What this this um, really comes under the category of what are the chances of that? The, the, the idea that you would go to Glastonbury having taken your mum's money uh, under false pretenses and, and you say, oh, no, she's never going to find out. But what if, you know, there's a picture, finds its way, well, she only reads the Daily Telegraph, they're never going to do anything <laughs> about Glastonbury, we'll be fine. Uh, and, and it turns out there it is. I, I agree with Pauline, absolutely the mum never was taken in by this at all. She'll recognise her, her own daughter. And the only reason I am going to not forgive is because of the Spin Doctors t-shirt, because uh, Spin <laughs> Doctors, not very good. Bring me your emails, I don't care. Spin Doctors, all not right. a very good band. Gather round, here comes another drive time confession from BBC Radio 2. You can send yours, uh, confessions at bbc.co.uk. If you miss any, the podcast is available every Friday. Go to the website. Father Simon and the Benevolent Judges of Fate. This is from Philip. Thank you, Philip. It's 1990. I'm a final year student in the wonderful city of Newcastle-upon-Tyne and living with a fellow student called Toby. My room was compact and bijou with a single bed, wardrobe and small desk. What more could I ask for, especially at only £11 a week? Toby's room was positively palatial in comparison and had the extra advantage that he had a colour television rather than my own black and white portable. Different times. There was a third student in the house, another student from our course, in fact. Whereas I was from North Yorkshire and Toby was from Northumbria, Alan was from Lancashire. This, perhaps, should have been a warning in itself. All three of us were enrolled in the final stages of a three-year degree course in accounting. 
Oh, they were wild times, <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. The three of us would spend many long hours in Toby's room, there not being enough space for two bodies in my room, let alone three, uh, discussing the intricacies of Modigliani and Miller's capital asset pricing model. Crazy, crazy times, indeed. We each had our own little foibles and quirks, of course. Nowhere was this more evident than in our approaches to nutrition. Toby's diet consisted entirely of Mars bars, which get another mention, breakfast cereal straight from the box and tinned garden peas on toast. Oh. Yes, peas on toast. Alan, we quickly learned, was a creature of habit, and after each of his meals, he would carefully and assiduously wash and dry his plate, knife and fork, put them back in the cupboard where they belonged. This behaviour, we felt, made him slightly odd for a student, even for an accounting one. As I've said, we spent most of our time in Toby's room. It was many weeks before we were invited into Alan's room. He'd always been a little secretive, not wanting us, it seemed, to enter his domain. Toby and I jokingly talked of what lay within, one speculation being that Alan was actually conducting some perverse scientific experiment on one of the students who'd left early the previous year without explanation. When he did eventually let us in, it was something much, much worse. He was tidy. Unnaturally tidy. His room was a peon to obsessive tidiness. Toby and I just stood and looked at each other in awe of what we were seeing. Everything was pristine. He had a collection of beer mats which he'd stuck to the wall as decoration. The finest Roman bathroom installation engineer could not have created a more geometrically perfect display than our friend. His range of musical tastes was exhibited for all to see along his mantelpiece. Every cassette tape he'd recorded was standing perfectly upright, each the same brand, each with a white spine and a red logo standing proudly at the top. On closer inspection, they were filed alphabetically. On his desk, pens were neatly stacked in a wire cup. His books were neatly stacked on one side, his papers on the other. Even his slippers were tucked neatly under his bed. We didn't have a compass with us, but we both instantly knew that they were at exactly 90 degrees to the bedside rug. We instantly felt sick to our cause. We didn't belong in this strange place. We looked at each other, made our excuses because Neighbours was about to start and left for the safety of our own slovenly dumps. Now, to this day, I don't know quite how we discovered that a phone card, if you remember them... Wow. We'd... It's a long time. This, is, long this time. is trip down memory lane. Never this, mind Blamange. Wow. We're right up to date now <laughs> yeah. with a phone card. Would just fit nicely in the gap between Alan's door and the frame. Nor that we learned that if you wiggled it just a bit, the latch would open, giving access to this weird and wonderful world. The first time we were in there, we just turned one of his cassette boxes upside down. So the red logo was now at the bottom and then slipped out again, locking the door behind us. Alan returned, didn't say anything, but was rather quiet. The next day we slipped in again. The cassette box had been righted and all was well in this strange world. We swapped two beer mats over. On another occasion, we put a cassette by R.E.M. before one by Queen. <laughs> this was chaos in action. We took a pen from his cup and left it on the desk. Then, finally... <laughs> yeah, we moved his poster of Einstein, or was it a naked lady, I can't remember, one inch to the left. We even then moved one slipper to the opposite end of the bed. Every time we made sure the door was safely locked on his return. We never said a word, but whatever we did, normal order had been restored the next time we went in. Now, one evening, tired of discussing the eight types of internal control looked for during an <laughs> audit, the conversation turned to the paranormal. Toby and I quickly declared ourselves firm non-believers, but Alan was less sure, admitting that he'd been somewhat rattled by a sequence of events in his room which defied explanation, and he was now pretty convinced that a poltergeist was in his room and must be angry with him because of the way it was trying to communicate. Toby and I naturally professed our shock at this. It was, of course, not too long until we completed our degrees and headed our separate ways, armed with the qualifications which would allow us to make our way in the dynamic and fast-moving world of accountancy. We've all gone on to successful careers, Father Simon, and your Institute of Confessional Auditors. Our trickery and japes, though, have weighed heavily on my mind in the quarter of a century since those crazy days. I beg forgiveness for the emotional and psychological impact our antics may have had on young Alan, who, I learnt some years later, had gone over to the dark side and become a tax specialist. We could never have foreseen the impact <laughs> our naive tomfoolery would have had on this impressionable young man, but he suffered more than enough now and deserves to know the truth, that he ended up with a belief in the afterlife which was based on us moving around his cassette tapes, pens and slippers. Well, it could be based on worse than that, I think. What do you think there, Sister Pauline? You probably feel an instinctive love for this world. 
of accountancy and numbers and money. Well, I do think the compulsively tidy are drawn to the world of tax inspector, regardless of whether or not they believe in poltergeists or not. So I don't think you should beat himself up too much about that. I think this is completely forgivable, totally forgivable. Who could not resist messing about with we, somebody we that obsessively awful, tidy? We get a lot of uh, confessions of people who, you know, go into someone else's room at university and they, you know, they, they turf it. it. Yes. Oh, yeah, they, you know, they completely trash it. But the idea of breaking in and then rearranging one pen or one cassette or moving Queen and R.E.M. around is really rather appealing. Remarkable, remarkable restraint. Well done. Yes. Well done, boys. OK, so that's gone quite well. Let's see what Bobby from the Priory makes of it. It reminds me of that lovely old black and white film Gaslight, where the wife is driven mad by the husband because he turns down the gas lights and she's the only one that notices and she goes steadily crazy. Nicely done. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that's what it reminds me of. It's, it's, do you know what? It's such a good sense of mischief, though. And you didn't take it too far. So that's fine. You didn't mess with his mind too much. Just those little suggestions that something was going Send on. Turn the cassette tape upside down. See, the thing is, is uh, crazy is that? I have done things like this to a friend for many years, hidden his shoes uh, for many years. I haven't seen him for a few Dangerous. years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just so you know, every time I used to go and stay at a friend's house, I used to hide all his shoes because I'm not a drinker, but he was. So he could never find any of his shoes. And I've been doing Already it since I was about world. 20 years. And you haven't seen him for... Long time Not ago. lately. Funny that. Only new stocky feet. Oh, forgiven. Great sense of fun. Thank uh, you, Matthew. For that. What are you making? Yes, I, I mean the beauty of this is that it's the small changes. I, I love the, the idea that he would have gone for his REM tape and gone, "Hang on, what's that doing before Queen and and after band beginning with P?" Um, so I um, the pokes. I, yeah, there That's you go. It. The pokes. The pokes. I remember in our in our student house we had a guy who was sort of obsessively um, uh, tidy in his room, and we broke in and we all took pictures of ourselves eating pizza in his bed, which is not the same as, as what's happened here. So, And for that reason, I'm going really to forgive. really rather pedestrian well, and boring. Well, no, it? believe me, they were very messy pizzas. We also He then took pictures of himself eating my Mars bar ice creams. Um, so, um, so, Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Other ice creams are also over, and chocolate bars. Um, so, for that reason, let's forgive. All right, OK. Yes. So here we go with another drive time confession. This one comes uh, from Gary, and you'll see why we've included it today uh, as we ease towards the end of this particular story. Gary, thanks very much, Steve, for this. Dear Father Simon and the All Forgiving Collective, by the way, I need to just warn you that if you're eating at the moment, there might there, there might be oh, an element yes. where you want to go, oh, really? Could you, could you not have waited? Well, no, it actually goes out at this time. So I'm just saying, if you're feeling... Slightly Jolly good. Easy. These are always the good ones, the ones we have to do warnings beforehand. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, I'm yeah. just saying, you know. This confession relates more to what I didn't do rather than did and could have prevented uh, but didn't. In fact, I made it worse. And with folk festival season upon us, I feel it's time to relieve my heavy conscience. It's the summer of 1987 and as we turned 17, the divide between motorcyclists and car drivers was forming. With me and my best friend, who we shall call Seth, favouring two wheels... Another close friend, who we should call Dave, chose four wheels and managed to buy himself a maroon Vauxhall Viva. Hedging his bets, Seth had also passed his driving test and shortly after his achievement, by chance, Seth and I met Dave and his maroon Vauxhall Viva. Seth says, can I have a go? I've just passed my test. Well, with a little coercion, Dave agreed, but in a very worried voice... Oh, I've got to do a worried voice now, a bit of acting. <laughs> well, hmm, must be on a quiet road. Out of harm's way, I don't sound worried. Well no, anyway, rubbish. no. Yeah. It must be on a quiet road, he said authoritatively. <laughs> Out of harm's way, <laughs> without any well sign done. of fear. Yeah. Yeah. Out of harm's way, well, I knew the perfect road, and off we went. Seth and Dave swapped, and as smoothly as a chauffeur, Seth guided the car down the country lane. At this point, it should be noted that the country lane ended in a gravel track. This is important not because of the gravel, but because of what lay next to it. We swept towards the gravel track, when Seth spotted the enormous lake of pig poo to one side. <laughs> it's, it sat at the end of a smooth concrete area, thinly covered in the same material, and it looked pretty slippery. He turned to Dave, laughed a devilish laugh. Actually, we've got a devilish laugh here. <laughs> Just like that. And turned onto the concrete. I have... Goose. Sounded like a hyena. Didn't it? <laughs> I have to admit that I don't think Seth expected things to turn out as they did. I think he expected us to spin around and drive off dramatically in the opposite direction. Suffice to say, we slid with epic predictability sideways into the lake of pig poo. Luckily, it was a hot day and the car window was open, <laughs> guaranteeing a steady flow of material into the car oh, and what? thus helping to reduce the impact. Dave exploded. 
Seth, for some reason, jumped out of the window and was instantly waist deep in this matter. I was incapacitated with laughter. We were silenced, though, by the smell. It was indescribable. Dave tried in desperation to drive the car out, only to discover that it was beached or sinking. One of the two. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there you go. It's got me. Dave logically insisted that we got, we got out, so we got out the car. But Seth and I were now caked from top to toe in pig muck, pushing the car out. We looked and smelt shockingly bad. So did the car. Mad Max would have been embarrassed. <laughs> it is for what happened next that I beg forgiveness. At this time, Father Simon, the Wimborne Folk Festival was in full swing and it stood between us and the only garage in town with a jet wash. Now, there were several routes that we could have taken, but I insisted. I know the best route, I said authoritatively again with no hint of fear, taking us right through the middle of town and therefore right through the festival. Well, the sight of the car was one thing. The smell of the car was clearly quite another. I absolutely need forgiveness from the patrons of the folk festival, many of whom were actually genuinely brought to actual vomiting <laughs> almost instantly as we passed oh, by. Dear. Such was the intensity of the smell. And I also need forgiveness from the Windsor Morris men who were mid-jig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. But were forced to use find other uses for their hankies. <laughs> A line we haven't had before. <laughs> Well, not broadcast. No. And obviously the organisers need, we need forgiveness from them for making the event so memorable for all the wrong reasons. To make matters worse, I have to tell you the jet wash was closed. <laughs> and I convinced Brilliant. Dave that the only route to Seth's house to clean the car was back the way we came. <laughs> and thus we got everyone that we missed the first time through. And this time it was Dumpy's Rusty Nuts <laughs> and Johnny Hobo and the freight trains who had to stop what they were doing and be appalled as the pig car went past. I also seek forgiveness from Dave. The car heater was never quite the same again, and there was always a subtle flavour inside. Please forgive me, for I know nothing about what I did, really. There's Gary, and uh, it's a fellow there. Anyway, so uh, we kind of get the gist of it, though, and uh, it's a folk festival favourite. What do you think of that, Sister Pauline? Well, my first car was a Vauxhall Viva, and I loved it very, very much, and that was 1987 too. And I myself... I've accidentally ended up waist deep in Is farmyard poo. Really? At the same, not in the same circumstances, but I know how grim it can be. What I can't forgive is having dro driven through the festival once. You might have been forgiven if you didn't know it was on, but then to drive back through it, you knew it was on and you did it again anyway. So yes. no, absolutely not forgiveness. No forgiveness. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see what uh, Lady Bobby from the Priory makes of it. Just are you really lucky actually? Lucky that the car started and kept going and got you back again. Uh, well done to the car. That's what I say. Good and cars. Very, very Bring good Bring them back. Cars. Oh, they have. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one thing I did want to say is really dangerous stuff as well. You really, I mean, you know, laughing aside, it was, you know, a slurry pits and that are a dangerous place to play near. Yes. Don't play near well, them it was again. Well, it was just in the field. Yeah, all right then. Uh, and secondly, just not forgiven. You're right. For going through once wasn't fair. It's going the through twice. Time, but they would have missed Dumpy's Rusty Nuts and Johnny Obo and the freight trains. And you don't want to I'm miss them. Uh, Dumpy's Rusty Nuts live. They're very good. <laughs> They're very good. Um, I have always... What about the Windsor Morris? Have you seen them? No, no sadly not. But, uh, <laughs> They've never I'm performed sure... again. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll bet. Um, I've always had a, a, an inkling for um, being, no, being sprayed in a jet wash. I, feel, I think that that might be quite a lot of fun. So it's almost as if this was engineered in order to be able to be sprayed by a jet wash, which um, I would be a part of. So I am going to say forgiven because I think I think there was uh, there was something else going on here that they secretly wanted to be in the jet wash. Really? I think that's I think I think he engineers it. <laughs> that's so the most they end pathetic up in the, excuse in for the forgiving I've ever heard. And then, and then get in the jet <laughs> wash because that sounds like fun. Well, this is a little bit of. <laughs> It's for the Winds of Morris guys. Good for them. Uh, OK, so it's, but I've got no idea what your reasoning was. There no, no, we'll there. never do. No. no. Well, that was this week's collection. So if that has provoked a little shadowy secret deep in the bosom of your soul, if indeed your soul has a bosom, uh, maybe send us your confession. It's confessions at bbc.co.uk, so there'll be none for a fortnight. And then we're back live in Edinburgh with some big showbiz confessions. Look out for that.